so I am the only member of the jury beside uh, Giuseppe Castagna, who's uh, physically present in the room. So I shall serve as the president of the jury. Uh, I, I would like to thank the members of the jury for participating in this defense, for making themselves available uh, at various places on the globe. So we are here today to listen to a presentation by uh, Victor Lanvin for his PhD defense. And so the usual process is that we begin with a 50-minute presentation, and then we continue with a session of questions uh, and a private deliberation of the jury. So I will give uh, the floor to Victor Lanvin for 50 minutes. Go ahead, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Pozo. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you, a member of the jury, even though it's quite uh, early uh, for you. It's I'm glad to have you here. Um, so these last few years, I've worked on uh, a semantic foundation for uh, gallery sensorotic types under the supervision of Giuseppe Castagna. Um, I'll start with a very informal presentation of uh, my work. So as you all know, uh, in today's world, we have plenty of, of devices. We have computers, we have smartphones. And all these devices are just machines. They are not particularly intelligent. And you have to tell them how to do something, how to, how to perform tasks, and how to help you uh, in, in, uh, in your lives. And that's the job of a programmer. A programmer is here to, to instruct the machine, to, to program the machine, so that it can do something useful. And what's a program? Well, a program is nothing more than a recipe. Um, you're just telling the computer a recipe so that it can do something. So, for example, um, you can write a program that makes some pizza. Uh, if you write a recipe to make pizza, um, you, you can. That's a program. You shape the dough, you add some base, uh, like tomato base, you add some toppings, and you cook everything. That's a program. And when you've made a program, when you've made a recipe, you're, you're really happy, uh, you're, you're proud of your, of your recipe, and you want to share it with the world, maybe on, on your uh, cooking blog or, or uh, programming blog. And um, other people can use your recipe to make their version of, of a pizza. And maybe somebody somewhere uh, will use your recipe to try to make a, a pineapple pizza. And you find that disgusting. You find, you find that sacrilegious. You don't want uh, somebody to use the recipe to make pineapple pizza. So what you want to do is forbid people to use your recipe to make a pineapple pizza. And that's, what, that's why we have types in programming. <laughs> um, that's obviously a bug. So you want to prevent this bug. And what you can do is add types to your language. And here, what we can do is tell um, people to only use uh, vegetable toppings. And if you restrict your recipe to use vegetable toppings, then people cannot make pineapple pizzas because pineapple is not a vegetable. So here, vegetable is a, is a type. Um, so you see, in the programming world, it's the same. You, you add types so that your programs you wrote, your functions cannot be used uh, cannot be misused. They, they can only be used the way you intend them uh, to. But there is a problem with this program or with this recipe, is that you cannot use it anymore to make your favorite pizza, which is a pizza with mushrooms and ham. Because ham is not a vegetable, so you can use you cannot use uh, this recipe. So you have several solutions, and in this studies I explore two solutions. The first solution is to use something we call sensorotic types. Um, it's a form of more powerful types. We can express more constraints or, or add more liberties uh, to, to uh, the programmer. And an example here would be to uh, say you could add vegetable or meat toppings. Vegetable or meat here is, a, is what we call a union type. It's a particular type of uh, sensorotic types. So now, if you write this, you can use your recipe with uh, either vegetable or meat. So it's perfectly fine. Another way to do the same thing is to use kernel types. Kernel types is just a way of telling, well, do whatever you want, add uh, whatever toppings you want to your pizza. 
But uh, if your pizza ends up being bad, you can only blame yourself. And you cannot blame me for making this recipe if uh, you add a pineapple to your pizza. So that's the two sides of uh, this thesis. We have set theory types, we have gradual types, and both have pros and cons, and we are trying to mix the two of them together to get the best of the two and maybe alleviate some of the shortcomings of uh, the two. So now that this <laughs> presentation is done, I delve a bit more into the details, uh, programming details of, of types and gradual types in particular. So what are uh, gradual types? Well, uh, let's use an example. Let's say we want to write a map function uh, that takes both arrays and lists and map a function uh, depending on the condition. So the map function takes a condition, a Boolean condition, um, some function of type uh, alpha to beta and some data. And if the condition is true, then it applies the function to the data assuming it is a list. If the condition is false, it applies a function to the data assuming it is an array. Um, in, a, in most programming languages, uh, you cannot uh, type such a function because data has two different incompatible types in the same function. It's a, both a list and an array in two different parts of the function, so you cannot uh, type this function. But what you can do with the other types is simply inform the compiler to ignore uh, the, the checks, the type checks for data by adding this question mark, this dynamic type, which tells the compiler to just accept your code and whatever you do with data. And of course, you do the same for uh, the return type of the function because the function can return uh, either uh, lists or arrays. So the important point with uh, gradual types is that the compiler will automatically ensure that you are not doing something wrong. So in particular, um, it will ensure that when you try to apply list.map on data, uh, uh, data is indeed a list. And uh, if you try to apply i.map on data, uh, data is indeed an array. And if it's not the case, then it will fail. So with gather typing, you have basically three cases. Uh, either the compiler can be sure that everything will go all right, and then it will simply accept the code. Uh, or the compiler uh, is sure that it will never work, in which case, will simply reject the code, or something in between. It cannot be sure it will always work or always not work. So uh, in this case, it adds uh, dynamic checks or casts to make sure that you're not doing something uh, bad uh, at one time. So to summarize gradual typing, the goal of gradual typing is to have both uh, static typing and dynamic typing in the same language, so you can have uh, both uh, depending on what you want. And this is done by uh, adding uh, this dynamic type, which in this, in this presentation we denote by a question mark. And this allows for a trade off between uh, save the safety of static types and the programming productivity that the dynamic typing uh, allows you. And the name gradual typing comes from the fact that this transition between the dynamic type and static types is gradual. So you can progressively add more and more type annotation or more and more information to your type annotations so that you can go, for example, from uh, the fully dynamic type to specifying that you have a function, but not knowing uh, what this function does. Then you can specify that this function accepts uh, integers, and then you can fully specify the type, the type as uh, being uh, int to bool. Hence uh, the name gradual typing. But sometimes a problem with uh, gradual typing is that this process, this gradualization, uh, or this spectrum, is a bit too coarse. And you'd like to have a bit more control on it. So, for example, let's say we use our previously written map function. Uh, we apply it to some Boolean, a random Boolean, the identity function. And then uh, instead of passing it a list or an array, we pass it a string. And in a programming language where string is incompatible with both list and array, this will always fail because um, whatever the value of the condition is, uh, you cannot uh, apply map to a string. 
So this always fails. And we'd like to reject these cases. We'd like, or at least give the programmer a, a way to reject such a, an ill-type program statically. We're still accepting the body of the function. We do not want to have a, a, an increasingly uh, verbose function. We do not, it's perfectly fine as it is with five lines of code, so we do not want to increase this. So this is why we study set theoretic types. Uh, what we can do with set theoretic types is instead say that data is either a list or an array. Here we use a union type this disjunction between array or list, say that data is either one or the other. And we do the same for the return type by saying that the function returns either an array or a list. Unfortunately, um, we can write this, but this is not well typed because if you try to apply list.map on data, uh, you need to ensure that data is a list. And unfortunately, since data can be both an array or a list, you cannot ensure that data is a list. So this program is not well typed. What we need to do with that sort of types, and it comes from uh, the union connective, is to explicitly deconstruct uh, union types. So what we could do is write this map function, and if the condition is true, uh, then we Type, we test the type of data. If it is a list, then we can safely apply a list.map on it. And if it is not, then we raise manually a, a type error at one time. And of course, we have to do the same for the, uh, if the condition is false uh, with uh, the type array. So this works. Um, in, a, in a language with set theory types, you could write something like this. Um, this is safe. You have all the uh, type information you want, but it's extremely verbose. Your function now uh, contains more than 10 lines of code, so this is not something we want. So to summarize uh, set of types, so these are types with uh, connectives, so union, intersection, negation. They can be used to type plenty of powerful features of programming languages. So for example, um, the intersection of uh, these two types uh, corresponds to the type of an overloaded function that maps integers to integers and boolean to booleans. Um, the union collective can be used to type uh, if uh, conditions. So this uh, condition that either return three or true can be typed as uh, int or bool. And the negation connective can be used with uh, more complicated features. So for example here, what we're doing is evaluate an expression E. Uh, if this expression evaluates to an int, return true, otherwise we uh, return its result. And you see that either this return bool or this returns something that is not an integer, otherwise it would have returned true. So we can use negation types uh, to, to type this such uh, piece of code. So to summarize, sensory types are uh, very powerful. You can type many features, but they are often syntactically heavy. As we have seen, you often have to add some uh, manual checks on the types of uh, your values. And an additional interesting point of sensory types is that you have this approach called semantic subtyping, uh, which we'll study further in the second part of this presentation. Um, in which you interpret types as sets of values. And using this interpretation, you can interpret the connectives as the corresponding set theoretic operations and, and the sets of values. And you can then interpret subtyping as a set containment on this interpretation. So this gives you a very intuitive and powerful way of defining subtyping. And this is particularly useful uh, for a type system. So you have these two approaches, sensuality types, schedule types, and both have pros and cons. On one hand, you have sensuality types, which are extremely safe and powerful, but uh, as we've seen, a bit verbose. And on the other hand, you have schedule types, which are inherently unsafe because they are meant to bypass the type checker. And there are However, uh, light and permissive, they can allow you to, to program very rapidly. So 
we want to mix the two, maybe to get the best of both worlds, maybe get the safety and expressiveness of statistic types with uh, the ease of use of uh, gathered types. And what can we do if we mix the two of them? Well, let's get back to our map function. This time without the uh, manual checks. What we can do is instead of simply typing data as list or array, we can intersect this type with a question mark. And what happens here is that by subtyping and the properties of the intersection connective, you can say that data now has type question mark or dynamic. And because it has type dynamic, you can use it however you want in the function. So the function as it is written right now is completely uh, fine. It is accepted by the compiler. And from the outside of the function, if you want to pass something to the function, uh, you need to make sure that it has both type of the intersection. And in particular, it must have type alpha list or alpha array. So you cannot use it with something else than a list or an array. And since it is gradual typing, all the checks are added automatically by the compiler. There is no need for the manual checks we, uh, we've added before. As a bonus, in our uh, approach, we'd like to also infer all known gradual types that occur in this program. So, in particular, we'd like to infer that the condition is a Boolean, that the function is of type alpha to beta, and we also like to infer that the function either returns list or arrays. And the important point here is that the function does not have a gradual return type. It always returns a list or arrays. So there is no need for a dynamic type application. OK, so how can we do this? Uh, if we were to apply immediately uh, the results of the literature or the methods that exist to embed uh, gradual typing in a type system, well, usually, uh, well, we would define uh, a subtype consistency, what we call a subtype consistency relation, noted this way. And this relation tells you whether you can use a type as another. The problem with this relation is that it is not transitive. Because what it tells you is that if you have the dynamic type, then you can use it as anything. And if you have any type, then you can use it, uh, you can give it to a function that expects a dynamic type. So this subtype consistency relation has this dynamic type both as a top type and a bottom type. And if it were to be transitive, it would be the total relation on types, which would not be really uh, useful for our purposes. So what you have to do is, once you've defined this relation, you have to embed it into the typing rule. For example, the typing rule for applications becomes this one, where you check that the type of the argument is a consistent subtype of the domain of the function. The problem here is that we have some theoretic types. And theoretic types are a bit more complex because the type of a function now is not necessarily a, a narrow type. It can be a more complicated type, like an intersection and union of arrows. And then you have to extract the domain of this type and the result of this type using type operators, which are actually well defined in the set uh, theoretic literature, but uh, are extremely complex and they complexify a lot of the typing rules. So we don't really want to use them and we'd like to find a better way of doing this. So this led us to our first approach, the first part of this thesis, which is about uh, adding gradual typing uh, in a declarative manner in our type system. And behind this approach uh, lies this intuition, which is that every occurrence of question mark in a language uh, behaves like a distinct type variable. For example, in our uh, map function, we have data that is typed using this dynamic type. And the idea is that in one branch, um, the type of data unifies to the type alpha list. And in another branch, the type of data unifies to uh, alpha array. So basically, whenever you type something with a question mark, it can, uh, at every point of the program, it can unify uh, to any other type. So hence the intuition that question mark behaves like a type variable. So this is our idea. We interpret occurrences of question mark 
as type variables. So what we do is we start by taking other types and we translate them into static types, so that is types with have question marks, but with variables. So for every occurrence of question mark, we replace it with variable. And using this interpretation of gradual types as static types, we define transitive relations on gradual types. And in particular, we define a relation called precision, um, whose non-set theoretic uh, version is well known in the literature. And we argue that this relation contains the essence of gradual typing. And by adding this relation to our type systems, and we try this with uh, three in increasingly complex uh, type systems, we basically find gradual versions of these systems. And an important remark is that this translation from gradual types to static types is only used when computing a relation. We do not perform this replacement in the program because we still want um, the same question mark to be able to unify to different types at different points of the program. So we do not do this replacement in the, in the source language. We only perform this operation when computing uh, our relations. So formally, what we do is we first define an operation that we call the discrimination of a global type. The idea is that you have a set of variables, x1, x2, a, a countably infinite uh, set of variables. And the discrimination of question mark is simply the set, is this set of variables. And you perform this operation recursively so that the discrimination of, for example, int to question mark interested with question mark is a set of all uh, int uh, to variable interested with another variable, possibly the same. And you use this discrimination operation to define uh, the two relations we want. So the first relation is precision. And as I said, this is a well-known uh, relation in the literature for its non set theoretic uh, version. It is actually the inverse of the precision relation defined in, uh, by Gershia in 2013. So we say that the type tau one is less precise than the type tau two. If there exists some replacement of uh, the dynamic types that occur in tau one, that's produce tau 2. And this notion of replacement of dynamic types is formalized using this uh, discrimination operation. And we can also define gradual subtyping using discrimination. The idea is, that, is to say that a type tau 1 is a subtype of type tau 2. If you can find two discriminations that are in subtype relation, that is, you can match the occurrences of the question marks in the two types, so that you obtain um, two types that are compatible for subtyping. So let's give some more details about this relation. Um, on one hand, we have subtyping. Subtyping is a relation that allows us to move inside the dynamic world or inside the static world in our program. Um, the important point is that it does not allow us to cross the barrier between the two. So you cannot remove or add uh, occurrences of the dynamic type using subtyping, except trivial uh, occurrences. And this makes it transitive as opposed to consistent subtyping because for this relation, question mark is only a subtype of itself. And it is not, for example, a subtype of int, nor int is a subtype of question mark. And You've seen that the definition of gradual subtyping we've given is simply relies on the definition of static subtyping. So if we want to handle unions and intersections, uh, any set theoretic types, uh, we can simply plug in the static version of uh, semantic subtyping and we obtain a gradual version of semantic subtyping. And in this interpretation, for example, uh, we have the usual properties of set theoretic operators. So that question mark is a subtype of question mark union int, and int interested with question mark is a subtype of question mark. On the other hand, we have precision. And precision is the relation that allows us to cross the barrier between the dynamic world and the static world. And only in this way, which makes it very important. That is, 
we have that the dynamic type is less precise than any type tau, and the type horizontal dynamic to dynamic is less precise than any arrow type tau 1 to tau 2, but we cannot do the reverse operation. And this is what makes this relation transitive, because you can go from dynamic to dynamic to dynamic, to dynamic to int, and then to a free static type into int, but you cannot go the other way around. So this means, since it is transitive, we can embed this relation into a type system using a subsumption like rule. So for some typing, we have some assumption. And here, for uh, precision, we have a rule we call materialization, with the intuition that a type materializes into a, a more precise type. So this is what we've done. Um, we've taken some, type, uh, some static type systems. For example, here we have a, a standard type system for a simple type from the calculus. And if we want to add subtyping and color typing to it, well, we simply have the materialization rule and the subsumption node. And we've done this for increasingly complex uh, type systems. For example, we've taken an Hindley Milner type system with lead polymorphism, and we've added color typing by simply embedding this uh, materialization rule. And later on, we try to add subtyping by simply adding uh, a subtyping or subsumption rule. So this gives you a very simple way of adding color typing to our type system, pro type system. And as a bonus to this approach, we get some nice results uh, almost for free. So for example, we get a uh, static gather guarantee um, almost immediately because all you have to do is lift your precision relation to two terms. And um, since you have this materialization rule, this uh, precision relation uh, is immediately um, preserved by typing, so you can get the static gather guarantee almost immediately. So this has some nice uh, consequences. So to understand how this works, let, let's get back to the body of our function uh, map. Remember that in this function, data had type uh, alpha a or alpha list in tested with question mark. And by subtyping the properties of the intersection connective, what we can do is say that the type of data is a subtype of question mark. And then by applying the materialization rule, um, since question mark is less precise than alpha array, for example, we can say that data has type alpha array. And therefore, array.map on data is well typed. And you can do the same with alpha list and obtain that is.map is well typed. Now, from the outside of the function, suppose that we try to apply the function uh, partially. So we've applied it to some Boolean condition, some function, and we are left with a function f that expects an argument of type array or list interested with question mark and returns some result. Um, let's say we want to apply to a string like we did before. For that, we would need to materialize the type of f to string to t or use the type system to uh, deduce string to t for f. Well, we cannot use directly materialization of the question mark because if you materialize a question mark to string, um, you obtain an empty type. That is, uh, array all this thing to do string, nothing uh, in most primary languages is in this type, so this is empty. And you cannot use subtyping either. Um, you, you could say that, well, maybe I use first subtyping to get to uh, question mark to t, and then you use materialization to get to string to t. And this is not possible, because subtyping has this nice property that it is contravariant in the domain of uh, type. So you cannot use subtyping to go to uh, dynamic to t and bypass uh, the array or list part. So in the end, you cannot apply this function to something else than array or list. Um, a question that arises uh, sometimes is that, are we still doing gradual typing? Since we got rid of consistency and consistent subtyping, um, and this precision relation only goes from dynamic types to static types, um, we got rid of an important point of gradual typing, and we could wonder if it's still gradual type. Well, thankfully, uh, we prove that if you have two types, tau1 and tau2, that are consistent with each other for uh, the consistency relation, um, you can find a third type, tau, 
which is more precise than both tau one and tau two. And so, instead of applying consistency, you can apply the materialization rule twice to type the same terms. And we formalize this result by studying <coughs> several existing type systems. So, for example, we showed that uh, in the original system of Sikataha in 2006, um, every typeable term can be given the same type in our system. And conversely, um, if you can type a term in our system, you can be given, it can be given a less precise type in the system of Sikentara. Uh, this is because we can al always apply materialization uh, how, many, how, how many times we want, so we can give it a, a more precise type in our system. And for a polymorphic system, uh, we, we found the same result uh, for the system of Yosha and Chiming published in 2015. So you see that we are still doing granular typing, and in a sense, this uh, two type systems are simply algorithmic versions of our uh, declarative uh, presentation. So the next part, the next part is uh, to compile our uh, source language to a cast language. So let's say we want to, to incorporate now the dynamic checks we've just spoken about and uh, a way to track it out. So basically what we do is, for example, we have a function that adds one to uh, its argument, which is dynamically typed. Uh, what it must do is first check that its argument is um, of type int before adding one to it. And if we want to apply this function to true, what we have to do is first uh, convert true to be of the dynamic type so that it can be passed to the function. And what happened here is that if we reduce this in a standard way, we obtain this expression, true cast from boot to dynamic, then to dynamic to int. And what happens here is that we're trying to cast a boolean to int, so this is obviously an error. And we add a blame label, which tells us which cast failed. And in, the, in this case, it's the cast that is trying to convert our boolean to an integer. The same, we, we could do the same thing, but in a different way. Basically, we could take a function that this time is statically typed and cast it so that we forget all about its uh, type. So now it's a function that is dynamically typed. And we pass it to Boolean in the same way by uh, casting this Boolean to the dynamic type. What we do here is something a bit different. Um, we first reverse extract information from the cast of the function to say that what we're doing is basically the same, that is casting true from boot to int. But we have to extract this information from the cast that is applied to the function. And to be coherent, we have to also say that we cast the result from int to dynamic. And now what happened is we blame the same cast basically for the same reasons. But this time we add some information. We have this little bar on N1 to, to say that it's not directly the cast L1 that failed, the cast on the function, uh, because, well, it didn't fail because the function was ill typed, but it failed because we tried to pass something that was not accepted by the function. So this blame has some information that tells you whether um, it's the value uh, on which the cast was applied that failed or uh, the context in which the value was used that failed. So blame is a, way to, is a way to tell us where an error occurred and in which way uh, the error occurred. And once again, the principle is very simple. Uh, it's that to every use of the materialization rule corresponds the cast. So what we do is we take our type system and we simply convert every rule into an identity compilation rule and say that for the, for the materialization rule, um, if we have E that compiles to E1, then if we materialize the type of E, then we just add a cast uh, from tau1 to tau2. So we obtain a very simple declarative presentation of the compilation system. And in particular, casts of the form int to question mark going to question mark to int are forbidden because the two types are not compatible, are not compatible for materialization. And moreover, what we can do is enforce the correspondence in the typing rule between the direction of a cast, so the priority of its label, 
and the direction of the precision between the types. And by doing this, we can get many uh, interesting results. For example, we can get um, type preservation uh, for declarative compilation immediately because the rules are mostly identity rules. And we can also get blame safety almost for free. Blame safety is basically a property that tells us what we expect. That is, um, only the part that is dynamically typed uh, can cause errors. If you have some statically typed uh, part in, in your code, it cannot fail. And since we only insert cast in one direction and enforce this relation between the direction of a cast and uh, the, precision, uh, the precision relation between the types uh, in the cast, we can get blame safety almost immediately. So to summarize, by interpreting question mark as a type variable, we can define relation and variable types in a very easy way using existing definition of static types. Um, during this presentation, we could define a very uh, simple way of declaratively adding variable typing to existing type systems using this materialization rule. And we've highlighted the direct correspondence between compilation and type derivation using this approach, which gave us many, many free theorems, such as a blame safety, type preservation of compilation, and static error guarantee. So is everything fine? Well, unfortunately, not really. Um, consider the reduction of cast applications. In a standard type system, we would do something like, in a type system without such authority types, we would do something like this. When applying a, a value to some cast function, we extract the information in the cast to distribute it between the value and the result. Well, with global types, as I've said, with set authority types, as I've said, it's a bit more complex because um, types are not necessarily our types. So you have to introduce type operators to extract the information from the types. And the problem is that those operators are well defined in the literature, but they are semantic operators. And they do not preserve the precision relation uh, between types. So adding such a rule will break the correspondence between cast and materialization. So actually, we found a solution which is very complex and rely on parallel uh, definition of type operators, but the cast calculus was very complex and contained 15 reduction rules for cast alone. So this led us to thinking that there was something wrong uh, in our understanding of uh, set variety global types. And this led us to the second part of this thesis, uh, which is about denotational semantics, in the hope of trying to find a solution to this problem. So let's get back first to semantic subtyping for a bit. I've said that we interpret in semantic subtyping, we interpret types as sets of values. Well, can we really do this? Let's say we want to define an interpretation function that takes some static types and a static type and return a set of values. Well, what you could do is define the interpretation of int as a set of all integers. And then you define uh, the interpretation of a function type as uh, the lambda abstraction that have this type. So to do this, you rely on the type system. You say that a lambda abstraction that has type tau1 to tau2, if it can type, it should can be typed using type uh, tau2 to tau1, and uh, this type is a subtype of tau1 to, uh, to t1 to t2. Now you see a problem, which is that to define this interpretation of types as sets of values, you rely on subtyping which is a circularity problem because you're trying to define this interpretation to define subtyping. So the solution uh, that comes in the, from uh, the semantic subtyping approach is to interpret types not directly as uh, sets of values, but as sets of subsets of a domain D, an interpretation domain D. So what you do is you interpret the type int still as a set of integers, but now you interpret the type of a function as a set of relations that map an element of type tau1 to an element of type tau2. And using this interpretation, you break the circularity problem. And you can define subtyping using a set theoretic uh, interpretation. So when we started this work, our goal was twofold. Um, first, we try to find a suitable domain interpretation domain for gallery types 
so that we could use the same approach to define a set theoretic interpretation of um, Galois types and uh, use its interpretation to define semantically our uh, relations, so subtyping and precision. And as a second goal, which I will not cover in this presentation, but is, that is covered in the, the manuscript, we wanted to bridge the gap that is introduced by breaking this correspondence between types and sets of values, because we are not trying, we are not interpreting types as sets of values anymore. So we we broke the correspondence uh, uh, between um, types and values, and we are trying to bridge the gap between the interpretation domain and the types. And we did this by giving a denotational semantics that interprets uh, values and expressions as a subset of uh, this interpretation domain. So I will only cover the first part. Um, how did we define a domain, an interpretation domain for gradual types? Well, the idea is to take the interpretation domain of semantic subtyping and add tags to uh, the elements of this domain. So we had two, two kinds of tags, uh, exclamation mark or static tag and question mark or dynamic tag. And the idea is that we distinguish between the elements that are always in a type, that is, these elements will be given a tag, uh, a static tag, and the elements that are in some instance of a type, that is, the element can be in a type if you replace the question marks correctly. And for these elements, we give the tag, uh, the dynamic tag. So the idea is that, for example, um, the interpretation of the dynamic type contains all elements tagged with question mark because you can always replace the question mark by a type so that an element belongs to it. And the static type, uh, for the same reasons, contains all elements um, with both tags. So for example, um, the interpretation of the type int contains all integers with both tags dynamic and static. And this led us to some interesting uh, remarks about set theoretic general types, which, for example, uh, we show that int and question mark the intersection of the two is non empty, but is not equivalent to int or to question mark because it contains exactly the integers tag with the tag. And similarly, int or question mark uh, contains both it integers and all elements uh, tagged with question mark, so it is not equivalent to int or uh, to question mark. Now that we have this domain, this interpretation domain for other types, we could use uh, an, an interpretation. We give uh, its intuition. We have an interpretation function that associates to every other type uh, part of this uh, domain. And we could use this interpretation to define subtyping following the same approach as uh, semantic subtyping. So by defining it as containment of the interpretation. And we were sure that we were doing something right when we managed to show that the subtyping relation we obtained this way is a conservative extension of semantic subtyping. That is, if you have two static types, then there are subtypes of one another for our interpretation, if and only if there are subtypes of one another for the semantic subtyping relation. And we can use the same interpretation to define precision set theoretically as by formalizing the crossing of values from the dynamic world into the static world. That is, we say that a type tau1 is less precise than a type tau2. If the values that are static in tau1 are still static in tau2, and the values that are dynamic in tau2 were uh, still dynamic values in tau1. So by precision, you cannot remove uh, uh, static values from a type, but you cannot add dynamic values uh, to a type. And this precision relation and subtyping relation uh, enjoy many, many uh, powerful properties. In particular, we show that if you have a type tau, then you can find two static types T1 and T2, which are more precise than tau, and in between which all materialization of tau are contained for subtyping, which gives T1 and T2 somehow a meaning of being the minimal and maximal materialization of uh, tau, which is why we write them uh, using up arrow and down arrow. So we call T1 the minimal interpretation of 
tau and t to the maximum one. And the nice thing is that you can obtain this, uh, this materialization very easily by simply replacing question marks with either the empty type, which is the type that contains no value, or the any type, which is a type of everything. And by replacing the contravariant occurrence of question mark with empty and the covariant occurrence of question mark with any, you can obtain the maximal materialization of tau and conversely for the minimal materialization of tau. So you have a very easy way of finding them. And the nice thing is that we even have a saturating interpretation of this materialization. Basically, the maximal materialization of a type is a set of, the interpretation of the maximal materialization of a type is a set of all values that are, uh, that have the dynamic type in its interpretation. And the same goes for the minimal interpretation of a type. So using this saturated interpretation, we could prove some very interesting results about our relations. For example, we can show that subtyping on normal types reduces to subtyping on static types using this, this uh, materialization. Um, what you have to do to check that tau1 is a subtype of tau2 is simply check that the minimal and maximal materialization are in a subtype relation for static subtyping. And for materialization for precision, we could do the same, except we just reverse uh, the maximal materialization of tau1 and tau2. Mm -hmm. And moreover, we have a very powerful result about the representation of gradual types under these uh, relations, which is that for every gradual type tau, you can represent tau equivalently for subtyping and precision using a single occurrence of the dynamic type and an intersection and a union connective. Basically, tau is equivalent to the minimal interpretation of tau union question mark interstate with the maximal materialization of tau. And this representation is not only nice because it gives us a very simple way of uh, defining other types, uh, we can also use it to define operators on other types semantically. So basically to define the domain operator uh, on uh, sets of vertical types, you can apply the domain operator, which is well defined on static types, to both the minimal and uh, maximal materialization of tau and reconstruct uh, the result using this interpretation. And you can do the same uh, for the other operators. And since um, it is a more semantic definition of the operators, it preserves the precision relation, which is the problem we had in the first part of this uh, presentation. So to summarize this second part, we have a saturating interpretation of gradual types that highlights many interesting properties and it ensures us uh, it's satisfies many intuitions we had about uh, gradual saturated types. Um, we use this interpretation to define many, uh, well, to define semantic versions of uh, precision and subtyping on gradual types, which we show can be easily decided using semantic subtyping on static types. And Moreover, using these semantic relations, we found a strong result about the representation of gradual types. We showed that we can simply uh, use a single occurrence of question mark to uh, represent a gradual set theoretic type. And this representation allowed us to devise an easy way of lifting operators from static types to gradual types while preserving all their properties, all the soundness properties and while preserving the semantic relation between types. So this greatly simplified the proofs of our systems and the semantics of uh, our cast language. So to conclude this presentation, um, in the first part, we showed a simple way of declaratively adding a gradual typing to existing type system using this, uh, by embedding this materialization rule. We also, uh, in the second part, showed a set theoretic interpretation of gradual types, which had many consequences and many powerful results. But we, there are also some parts that are not shown in this presentation, but in the manuscript. Um, we have some algorithmic systems, and in particular, we have a gradual type language 
with authority types, we, we have uh, a type inference algorithm, we have a uh, cast language and the full operational semantics of this cast language. We have also denotational semantics for several languages, um, including CDU, so a language with uh, full fledged set of types and many powerful features of them. And we also have a denotational semantics for uh, category type lambda calculus, but only with simple types. And as future work, we'd like uh, to do several things. First, we'd like to unify the two parts of this work, so maybe retrofit uh, the relations we found in the second part to simplify further on uh, the first part. This would maybe lead us to lead us to a sound and complete type inference algorithm for uh, gathering set sorted types. For now, our inference algorithm is only uh, sound but incomplete. And we also like to add more features to our cross language, such as intersection types of function, functional volume, and maybe uh, dynamic type. And finally, we'd like to enhance our denotational semantics to support uh, sets of types and not only uh, semantics. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Victor. So, still no news from Avik, I guess. We will be beginning the question session, and uh, it's customary to begin with the reviewers and to begin with uh, the reviewer who is the farthest away. So uh, th this would be Ron in this case, Ron Garcia from the University of British Columbia. Ron, do you have questions? Uh, thank you, Francois. Can can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for the, the presentation, Victor. Uh, That's a really nice body of work. Uh, I enjoyed reading the thesis and uh, I uh, appreciated your, your summarization in, in uh, this presentation as well. That was really uh, helpful. So um, I guess a, a, a first quick question is, uh, you have this um, diagram with the triangle where you have consistency and uh, the two instances of precision. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you find a connection between this idea and um, uh, th threesomes from uh, the paper by uh, Phil Wadler and Jeremy Seek? Uh, it almost looks like there's a some relationship between this picture and that idea. Yeah. Um... Indeed, I think there is definitely a connection between the two because that's that's exactly what they do, uh, um, except they do it from an, an operational uh, point of view uh, in the cast language. Um, yeah, basically they split a cast in a two casts going in uh, the two directions so that they can preserve uh, precision between uh, the pairs of types they compare. So yeah, basically the same idea, but we, we, we were only doing it on a, a declarative uh, system. This is only uh, to show uh, th that our declarative system is a uh, conservative extension of all the others. Um, but we have not applied it like uh, Phil, um, well, uh, we have not applied it to uh, cast language. We have not, we, we do not split our cast in uh, threesomes. So yeah, I think that's definitely the same idea. The, the core idea is the same. Uh, we simply apply to di two different settings. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess uh, going to the, the the more about I guess the second part of the the, the work where you're uh, developing this de denotational semantics for um, set theoretic types and then using that to give a model for gradual set theoretic types, and and this is very interesting. It, it says a lot about the expressive power of set theoretic types in particular. And I guess the, the question that I have is, in a language where set theoretic types are perhaps not the, uh, the primary goal for a type system, um, but perhaps you have a, uh, some other sophisticated type system for which you would like to add gradual types to it, do you think that set theoretic types uh, in, in, your, in your investigations, does it seem like set theoretic types make a, a, 
a general substrate for adding gradual typing to uh, an arbitrarily typed la arbitrary language, or, or do you find that those results are primarily focused for if one already has set theoretic types and wants to add gradual typing? Is it, is it just interesting how to the extent to which you could compile gradual typing to set theoretic types? And I was wondering if that goes beyond explicitly desiring to support set theoretic types. No, uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, as, as, as you said, in, in the first type of is the first part of the series, we, we found that uh, color types and set theoretic types did not mix very well together. And uh, it was very complicated to have both of them. And actually, yes, in the second part, I think personally that uh, we've showed that set theory types can be used to uh, add color typing to uh, uh, to a system. You can use them to help adding color typing. And at the very least, I think you can. Um, well, if you don't want to add, if you don't want to add um, set theory types to your system for uh, various reasons because they are pretty complex. Um, you could still use this, uh, th the notions we showed, in particular the representation of Galois set theory types, to maybe deduce some intuitions about uh, how they are supposed to work. Um, maybe, well, for example, we, we, we used um, the representation of Galois set theory types to, to lift the operators from other types to other types. And you can, I think you can use, you can use them to, to gain some intuition and to gain some insight into uh, the behavior of your type system when adding model types, um, even if you don't want to add full-fledged theoretic types uh, to, to your system. I think that can be a very powerful tool uh, to do this. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, the last question I'll ask is, um, it, it, it seems like the especially in the first part of the, the thesis, the mechanisms that you introduced um, do a very nice job of, of making some of the prop desirable properties very evident. So the ability to quite uh, directly uh, provide blame and, and establish blame safety and the ability to quickly establish the static gradual guarantee for the, the static type system structure. Are there aspects of this perspective that have heavily, that have, influence the design of the dynamic semantics and maybe properties of the dynamic semantics aside from, I guess blame safety is a, is a dynamic property, but are there others that you are able to address or, or, or just influence the design of the dynamic semantics? Yeah, uh, um, it actually guided. The, the reason why in the first place we had this very complex uh, gas calculus with uh, 15 rules for the reduction of gas is exactly because um, this approach guided us uh, towards designing the semantics and we were really uh, focused on preserving this uh, materialization relation because it also greatly simplified uh, the, the type preservation uh, proofs. Um, well, at least it could have simplified the type preservation proofs. Um, and yes, we were really focused on preserving the invariance of our type system. So unfortunately, this made the dynamic semantics much more complicated than anticipated because of this parallel operators and uh, which uh, were required to ensure that we were preserving this materialization rule. Um, but in the end, after the, the second part of uh, the thesis, after the denotation of semantics, uh, we used, we embedded, uh, we took the definition, the semantic definition of the relations to simplify uh, the dynamic semantics of our first part. And indeed, the, I would just say that the, the um, preserving uh, the invariance that we had in our type system and, and drawing inspiration from our type system to define the dynamic semantic. Uh, led to at, le at least greatly simplified uh, most of the proofs. So I think about type preservation. Uh, we have some very nice uh, properties about uh, the interaction between materialization and subtyping that 
uh, makes uh, type preservation much easier to prove. Um, but mostly our focus when, was on preserving this notion that two types in a cast must always be uh, compatible for uh, precision. Okay, um, thank you very much. That's, that's really, I'll uh, uh, complete my uh, questioning there. Okay, thank, thank you, Ron. Uh, so we'll move to the second reviewer, Peter Thiemann from the University of Freiburg. Okay. Well, I, I would first of all also like to um, uh, express my appreciation for the thesis. So you've really got uh, great results and um, uh, it was really a pleasure to read the thesis. So it really opened many new perspectives, I think, at least for me. Um, so uh, now you've, you've talked quite a lot, I mean, guided by Ron's questions about uh, ways that you can use materializations. And so I was also wondering, are there any disadvantages of materialization? Are there, what, what are the limitations of that approach? Well, the main limitation is that, um, it only gives you a way to, to uh, defining uh, easily a declarative type system. Uh, if you want to define an algorithmic type system, and in particular, if you want to define an algorithmic <coughs> compilation system from your source language to your cast language, um, you, you still have to manipulate kernel types as uh, you would manipulate them uh, without materialization. So uh, actually, in our uh, inference type system, uh, in our infant system, the, the crucial point was not materialization, but this, this combination operation. This was the operation that we used the most because we could reduce um, inference of, on gadol types of gadol types to, to simply to sim simple unification problems by translating gadol types to uh, types with uh, variables. So we didn't really we didn't really use materialization. Uh, in our uh, inference algorithm and compilation system, mm -hmm. but it very relied on, uh, mostly relied on uh, this discrimination operation. And I think that's not really a, a shortcoming of the materialization relation. It's just that this relation is meant to be used, is more meant to be used in a declarative fashion than in an algorithmic fashion. However, we, as I've said in future work, we'd like to, to try to use a semantic definition of materialization. Uh, to maybe simplify the, the compilation algorithm, but that's something we have not um, developed yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so then I was wondering about one particular aspect. I mean, at the end of the talk, you already mentioned that uh, uh, that you can use these minimal and maximal materializations in order to express like subtyping and all that. So, so then I was I was wondering what happens if your minimal materialization so the thing with the down arrow makes the type empty so for example if you have if you have a type like int times question mark um, um well i mean that's uh, that's a pair of an integer and something that's that's unknown at least in my intuition um but if you if you take the least materialization then unless my my set theoretic reasoning is broken then you get the empty type on the as the lower bound right is that correct you, you, you're perfectly right um, indeed you, you you get the empty type and therefore you can use um uh, using subtyping int times question mark can basically be uh, used as anything uh, because it's minimal a materialization will always be a subtype of any other thing mm -hmm. um, so you're not guaranteed that that you're dealing with a pair anymore. Yeah, but you will uh, add a check. You you will always add a type check. So there are two um, two important uh, points. Uh, this is not really problematic for for pairs because um, you're still comparing uh, the maximal materialization, and the maximal materialization is not empty. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to use it as something that is uh, not a pair, so for example, if you want to use it as a function, you still have to compare that 
int times any, uh, you still have to make sure that int times any is a subtype of your function type. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. is okay. So this prevents subtyping uh, from being misused. Uh, but as you said, um, the fact that the minimal materialization is um, is empty means you can, use, you can materialize it basically as anything. Mm -hmm. um, and this means that you will use uh, a dynamic check. You will mm -hmm. introduce a dynamic check. So you will not get an error, you will, or at least your program will not be stuck. You will get a runtime type error if uh, you try to use it as something else as a pair. Um, however, of course, this means that you will always program that may always fail. Mm -hmm. because, uh, you can maybe pass something of type int time question mark to a function that expects a string. Um, and of course, this will always fail. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a, a, a shortcoming of this representation. No, I see. Mm -hmm. OK. So, um, um, so, so the reason why I'm interested in, in I'm so much interested in this materialization is is this. So, um, um, I was I was working on stuff where I needed to define consistency or consistent subtyping in a de dependently typed setting, and I was hoping that maybe that can be more easily described using materialization. So is there a set theoretic story for dependent types already somewhere? That's already dependent types. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think there are any. I don't know of any. Um, I, I know that there are some attempts at defining uh, gradual dependent types. Um, with liquid types and, and approaches such as this one, but I, I'm not aware of any uh, work on uh, dependent set theoretic types. Okay, so so do you see a principal issue in, in going that way? I'm not really familiar with dependent types, so. Um... I mean, not, not even, I mean, even in general, not even connected to gradual types. So if you have this, this set theoretic subtyping approach would is, is there do you see some some obstacle in, in transitioning that to a dependently type setting um, I guess you would have it would be quite difficult to define set theoretically uh, uh, to give a set theoretic interpretation of dependent types but I guess for some restricted form, um, maybe maybe you could. Uh, uh, I I don't have many examples of uh, different types mm -hmm. in mind, but uh, you can probably. I mean, your the example that you presented in this talk that cries for dependent types, right? Yeah, it's actually quite close to dependent types. Yeah, um, so, and and so that's that was something. Um, uh, I mean, some of the motivation, at least for me initially, to to look at gradual types was that that I that the things I wanted to express were like dependent types, and um, uh, if if you have them, then the need for gradual types kind of vastly diminishes. Yeah, uh, indeed. indeed. At least in a practical setting, yeah. I think. What what I so I I think actually dependent types I think can be. Uh, at least it can be really intuitive to think of dependent types as uh, sets uh, as sets of, of values or, or an interpretation mm -hmm. domain. Um, I mean, conditions and, and, uh, and uh, restrictions on, on uh, your dependent types can simply be a restriction on, on the, of the sets of values. Um, what I have a hard time saying is how do you define a set theoretic interpretation of dependent types? Uh, a very general uh, set theoretic interpretation of dependent types so that you, you're not too restricted to the form of the dependent types mm -hmm. uh, you, you're going to use. That that would be a nice perspective. I'm afraid I'm not knowledgeable enough on dependent types to. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I, I I think I think in full generality, then then you can't find a set theoretic model. That that would be my my hunch. 
but if you have certain restrictions, maybe things can be can be done. But I, I'm I mean I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not working in set theoretic types, of course. Um, last question that I had was this. So initially, I had some trouble aligning to uh, to the underlying idea of gradual types in the context of set theoretic types, because my kind of intuitive understanding of set of gradual types means that if I have something of type, uh, well, let's say int, then this value doesn't really doesn't really carry type information anymore. And then if I actually have a, uh, if I actually have a, a value of type dynamic, then it's actually such an untagged value uh, with a wrapper that says, with an injection that into some universal type or into the dynamic type. But some, somehow in, in, this, in this set theoretic work, there seems to be a basic assumption that you are always able to distinguish types at runtime yeah. and that that is kind of that was some weirdness that i didn't get in initially i have to say yeah that's that, that's actually not a consequence of gala types but of, of set theoretic types um if you if you want to have um unrestricted union types uh you need to have uh, type information attached uh, at, at one time uh, because for union types to be useful, uh, I, I've shown this in the in the example in the introduction. Um, so we had this. Uh, I, I won't go back here, but we had this uh, array or list type, and if you want to use it, um, you need to deconstruct the union using using a dynamic type check, um, and that's the only way to use union types uh, non-trivially. So uh, if you really want to have full-fledged set theoretic types, you need to have a form of dynamic type check, and therefore you need to have a form of um, type information at one time. Mm -hmm. and in particular, you, you need to keep annotations on your function, you, you, you need to, and well, base values, integers, and uh, other values can simply be checked. Mm -hmm. But you need to keep this information. So how would, we, how, how would you respond if I said, Oh, then you added gradual typing to a language that was already gradually typed before. Sorry, you add gradual typing? Well, in your work, you are adding gradual types to a language that already had runtime type information, gradual yeah. types before. Yeah, but we're adding gradual typing with the idea of simplifying the, the, the um, the writing of programs in the source language. So indeed, the representation of, of values uh, under the hood doesn't change. Mm. But we are changing what you can write and what you, you cannot write in your program. In particular, uh, this means color typing. Adding color typing means that we do not have to deconstruct the types using dynamic type checks manually. We can uh, defer this task to the compiler, for example. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're really uh, trying to simplify uh, the job as a programmer by adding other types. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm fine. I, I have another question, but I think that Amal will ask it anyway. Thank you. We'll continue with uh, Amal, and, and we'll, we'll come back to, to Peter if you want to ask more questions later. So Amal, Peter, I'm curious what you think I'm going to ask. but. <laughs> Do you, want me to, do you want me to tell you? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in your work with Max, you're looking at equational theories. Yes. <laughs> and so I was expecting some question about whether ETA laws hold or something like that. OK, I wasn't quite going to ask that, but OK. <laughs> Um, so, Victor, I think Peter has already asked the kind of really big question. First of all, let me start by saying, yes, this is really nice work. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it was really fun to read the thesis and made me think about a lot of things. Um, so um, what I wanted to ask, and Peter has already asked about, is um, as I was uh, going through this, I was thinking about dependent types as well. Um, and, you know, going back to like uh, something that Ron has brought up and Peter have brought up, I kind of was think, trying to put those two thoughts together. Um, 
basically in response to one of Ron's questions, you said that, um, you know, one does not necessarily have to add set theoretic types to your language if you don't want to, but you can use the intuitions that you have from, you know, thinking about this in, uh, in with a sort of lens of set theoretic types in order to um, design your, your language and uh, come up with the design of the dynamic semantics. Um, so I was kind of trying to think about that. Um, I wanted to I was sort of wondering if you could um, conjecture a bit as to how one would go about using that approach when designing a gradually type dependent language. Now, I know you've already had some discussion, but I'll, I'm slightly rephrasing the question. Um, if you start from a sort of denotational semantics lens, perhaps to assist you, um, but you're not necessarily thinking of set theoretic types, um, do you think that this would be a useful approach to try to? come up with the right um, semantics in, in the presence of dependent types? So coming with, uh, coming from a denotational point of view, yeah, I'm fairly afraid not because, <laughs> well, simply, well, simply because uh, while this presentation uh, with gadol types and such, uh, well, we found that set already types really complement uh, gadol types, mm -hmm. but that was really limited to uh, the set theoretic interpretation of types and to this uh, precision and subtyping relations. We, we've actually found that uh, from a denotational point of view, uh, set theoretic types and, and uh, Galen types don't play that well with each other. Um, unfortunately, that's why we restricted ourselves to a, a simply type standard calculus for our uh, I would simply type global type uh, lambda calculus for our denotational semantics because um, really we found that giving a denotational interpretation, in particular of cast of cast explorations, uh, when you have sets of types in cast, it gets extremely complicated, and you get back to the problem of to the problem of uh, defining type operators uh, that act on cast um, and use these operators to, to define the denotational semantics of a cast. And this was extremely complex. And uh, we, we that's something we still have as future work. So I don't think from a denotational point of view, uh, or at least I don't see how from a denotational point of view, uh, you can use set of types to, to facilitate uh, the introduction of color types. Um, I see. I was I was kind of trying to think more in line in terms of you know using the intuitions of set theoretic types, but not necessarily having set theoretic types in your language. Uh, okay. Um, is is the main difficulty that you're sort of um, hinting at the the construction of a denotational semantics for de dependent types? Uh, sorry, excuse me. Is the main difficulty that you're sort of thinking of that, you know, um, is it that it's hard to come up with a denotational semantics for dependent types? Uh, well, for, for uh, yeah, for set theoretic, no, for set theoretic color types, it's very difficult to come up with a denotational semantics. Yeah. Um, for, for, I mean, for a language that supports, a cast language that supports a set theoretic types and color types, it's very difficult to come up with a denotational semantics. Uh, yeah, that's that's my point. I see. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask about a different thing. Um, one of the things that I was sort of wondering about um, as I was reading this is um, a connection to a very different property. Um, so uh, there's been work on a property called complete monitoring. Um, you know, Matthias Falaise and Christos de Mulas, um, people like that. And I was wondering if um, you know. In any of this work, if you've uh, thought about how these um, set theoretic types or your denotational semantics work, kind of putting those two ideas together, if there is some, um, I found myself wondering if there was some sort of a better semantic characterization of this property called complete monitoring um, in the literature. And if your work could perhaps hint at something, um, a better way to study it. Um. That's uh, that's a nice question. Um, I I've not really studied this question. Um, 
because well I, I start uh, uh, I've actually asked the same question but about uh, um, the gradual guarantee uh, uh -huh. I was trying to find a, a denotational interpretation of the gradual guarantee yeah um, actually I, I think I think we can uh, we, we need to, to, to continue this work a, a bit to to reach uh, such uh, such a result but I think yes I think that it's definitely something we can do in uh, we can manage at some point um, because we we have this in our denotational semantics we we have this notion of of um, um, a denotational notion of cast that can fail or a cast that cannot fail. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, the idea is that um, when you interpret uh, a value uh, or uh, an expression uh, denotationally, you, you can, by checking which um, elements uh, are statically tagged or dynamically tagged, um, and checking whether they appear with the same tag in the type in, in a cast in the type of a cast you can know whether the cast will always succeed or always fail uh, in particular if the dynamic uh, if the uh, denotational semantics of your expression is included in uh, the interpretation of uh, a type yeah. um, which is a nice property that comes from uh, the fact that we interpret types and expressions uh, using the same domain if you can prove this, then you can prove that a, a cast will never fail. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so. I've not uh, I've not had time to, to to reach this conclusion yet. But I think you can use it to define uh, dynamic properties such as uh, complete monitoring or, or the gradual guarantee, uh, dynamic gradual guarantee, uh, in a denotational way. So how would that relate to the, the dynamic gradual guarantee, you know, the way that um, Max uh, and I, that we've been proving it, um, you know, using a logical relation and giving interpretations of um, precision, of the type precision relation as, uh, you know, a binary logical relation basically on terms? So I, I'm not sure about the details. Um, yeah. Maybe we still need to use a, a logical relation much like we would we, we put the, the adequacy of the semantics and nature of it. Uh, I think that, well, the, the nice thing is that you can, you can um, since you have this set theoretic definition of precision, yeah. this definition can be immediately applied to the denotation semantics of expressions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because since you interpret expression and types in the same domain, you can use the same relation to compare the semantics of your expression. So you can define whether uh, an expression is more precise than another. Uh, and this automatically lifts your uh, precision relation to expression. Um, and I'm not sure if you need to, I'm not sure if to conclude you need a um, uh, logical relation yeah. um, to, to, to relate um, denotations and expressions, but I quite uh, confident that uh, you can, you can, you do not need a logical relation because you, you can really directly use uh, this set theoretic interpretation. You can already reason at the level of the set theoretic types in a sense, right? They're giving you the, uh, yeah. I, I, I would hope that uh, this is okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I think my final question was just more of a maybe curiosity. Um, I was wondering, um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about intersection types for function types. Um, what you think, you know, needs to happen uh, to make that work out? Um, so that's that's a, a very complex problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it, actually, when we started this work. Uh, in my uh, internship, um, we had a system, a uh, gallery type language with set sorted types and uh, intersection types for functions. Um, we had uh, a sound uh, semantics for this language, dynamic semantics for this language, but it relied on a very complex operation. So basically, what we did was when we had an intersection type 
of a function, um, we compile it to a type case that checks every uh, type of intersection. So basically, if you have an intersection, um, a function that maps integers to integers and booleans to booleans, what we did is we took the parameter of the function and did two dynamic checks. And if the parameter was an int, then perform some operation. And if the parameter was a, a bool, then perform some other operation. And this was actually necessary because when you introduce Gerdel types, um, depending on which type you select for your function, you can introduce different casts. So you have to separate, you, you have to, to, to compile the function in different ways for all the types that occur in, uh, in its uh, intersection types. And this, led, this leads to a, a computational explosion of the number of, uh, of the compilation. Uh, so that, that was actually the only way we found to do it. Um, I think either it's this solution or we need to find another representation of cast that allow uh, multiple casts to coexist, yeah. multiple versions of the same function to coexist. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you, Val. So we'll continue with uh, Eric Kearns from Google. Yeah. Uh, so I was just thinking about, uh, let, let, oh, let me first say that I'm really impressed by, this, by the work. It's very, very nice. And it's, uh, uh, it's some very impressive results in able to produce. I'd so like to give, give a plus one on that one with all the other. The other. Uh, then I was uh, very impressed by the beauty of your uh, res results of the extreme materializations. So uh, I believe that, that was uh, slide 32 or so. Um, and I was always th thinking, I was also think thinking, um, my, my case is, is um, practical, practical programming is object object oriented ones mute, uh, uh, with, with, with mutable state. Um, so I was thinking if you're in this situation where your language has uh, invariant uh, types in very variations in types. Uh, I guess the ability to describe the uh, gradual types as ranges from some type to another, from a static static type to another. That way, is there any way you can sort of repair repair it? I'm not sure I've understood everything um, because there, is a, there seems to be a problem with uh, the audio. Um, so I haven't understood exactly everything. So you say that uh, you have a range uh, from the two types, and what uh, what do you want to repair? So, so the issue is if if you have an extension of your language that introduces a uh, possibility for a, a type variable to be invariant, you have a covariant and constant positions with fonts. It's all uh, uh, you know completely normal. normal. Uh, but if, if you have something like a ref, ref cell or something like a record that contains functions, then you could have type variables that are uh, used in ways where uh, you do not have, have a subtype relationship uh, when you, you have a relationship between the, the those type variables. So you, so you just have, uh, you have invariance for, for the type variable. And in that situation, I believe that you, you cannot find a range uh, such that you describe all, all the materializations of, of a given uh, grid type uh, as something that thing between two static types, other than you know between uh, the empty type and the full type. So you're going to lose all the information about, about the type uh, if gradual and, and if have, have invariance. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do some inference on the part I have not understood. Uh, um, actually. Um, what, one, one important point is that uh, when you have invariance, uh, uh, when you have some conditions about a variable in the type, uh, a, a range and a variable in type, um, oh. um, that, that's only on a variable. So this is not, uh, I mean, th this, uh, this range between two types is only obtained by considering the, the uh, dynamic type. So you do not 
perform this operation on type variables. So you do not, you do not lose the information, the, the range information you have about uh, type variables. Um, yeah, but you, you, you're, you're, characterizing, you're characterizing the soundness of a program execution such that if you have an expression whose, whose type is a gradual type, uh, then uh, your uh, system sound uh, or, or is unsound if the uh, dynamic type of the uh, actual, actual value of expression is between the, uh, uh, the Disclosure and the great gray disclosure error down and then the error, error up. Um, or at least or at least that that's one way to think of it that seems to make sense to me. Yeah. How you express that these types are uh, ranges uh, between step types. Uh, we expect the, the actual value to have that that type will be typable with uh, one of the types that belong to that range. Yeah, okay. That is not going to be true. In a way that is useful anymore. If you have invariances, then your your range is not going to be a type type with a particular structure to a to a type different with, with the same structure. Like it, it's not from from pair of uh, bottom bottom times bottom to a pair or of one times one of, of, of something like that. Uh, it'll be from from the bottom to the top type type. Just no, you don't don't know anything. It's it's uh, there's no information there if you have invariance. Because the range is not going to be informative. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have much examples of type system. I've not manipulated a lot of type systems that work in this way. Uh, uh -huh. But I, I would think that if you have a range, that's a range. That's a range for 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 subtyping. So I, I would think that uh, if you say that um, a value has a type in a range, uh, the range is two types is comprised of two types that are uh, comparable for subtyping, and like between the two you cannot. Uh, I, I mean, I would hope that between the two. You do not add or remove uh, occurrences of the dynamic type. So you cannot have a range that goes from a static type to a dynamic type. In which case, indeed, you would lose every information by using, uh, you would not preserve the range by using these operations. But if you have a range going from a type T1 to a type T2, uh, which are somehow comparable for subtyping, the then if you apply, if you apply um, these external materializations to the two, you obtain, you still obtain two ranges uh, that are ordered in the same way. So I think you can still use uh, information about these ranges. Mm. I, I mean, we 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 would have to to study a type system, I guess, with a, a non-pure language. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. But you also also have it if, if you had records, and they could could have functions. You have a type variable in the record type, and uh, you have a function uh, in one field where this type variable is used as a an argument, and another field where this type variable is used as the turn type of a function. So so I mean, let's just go on to, on to the next uh, question. I'm thinking about. The interpretation of a sort of sort of conceptual understanding of uh, of the uh, use of set set theoretic types. Uh, so, so the theoretic types uh, associated with this intuition that you want to describe the actual behavior of the uh, uh, program language uh, in term terms of connecting. Uh, a type, type with a certain set of values, and those values are expected to be values that you could encounter uh, when you're running the program. So, for instance, if you have uh, something that has type, type, then you have a set of, of int values, and then if you run your program with something, something like int, you look at it, it belongs to that set. Yeah. Uh, you seem to stray away from that, that 
pretty pretty, pretty uh, substantially. Uh, so if you think about the, the uh, chapter twelve uh, notion of, of function, you have function types, or maybe I'm I'm, I'm messing up the chapter a bit. But you certainly have have function type where you have you have a rotation of a function which is a set. Uh, that contains an uh, infinite number of uh, uh, finite approximations of uh, uh, the function that is the pair pairs of an input to an output to an output. Uh, and then you invent extra elements for the input, like the uh, Agamemo delta, the Agamemo D, uh, or the Agamemo. You have various of those. So that means that you're moving further and and further away from something that actually um, is similar to the function that you might encounter to account at runtime. And then, in in order to handle the fun function type, include uh, conjunctions. Uh, uh, you introduce a an annotation on the function, which is the type of the whole function. So to me, that it looks like you're going from further and further away, actually saying, saying oh, you have sets of to, to types. So we are describing the actual behavior of the program in terms of something that you can easily understand. Just look at the set and you have one of the elements in that set. But it's happening here, here is really, uh, as, as far as I see that you're manip manipulating the mathematical objects that you have available, including things like Agamo D, uh, and that makes it possible for, for you to get the right, right relations. You have the right, the right sub relationships. You have the typing relationship function has, has that type. Uh, but, but it's completely removed from the uh, dynamic semantics. Takes basically, it's more and more similar to tags. And you also may mentioned that the tag for them. You talked about the types and the ability to program with that. That. Yeah. So, so can, can you? This is very, very conceptual and not very mathematical. Basically, can, can you give me your thoughts about why it is meaningful to say they they have set the text types types or, or could or could just as well have used another mathematical structure that would give you the same relations yeah um so as you have as you have probably noted um all this problem comes from the fact comes from negation types uh yeah. if, if it were not for negation types we would not have this problem and we could still I have this interpretation, this very nice interpretation of functions as relations that map values to values and not have to use this uh, agimo uh, that does not correspond to any value. And whose point is only to uh, have a nice uh, subtyping relation. Uh -huh. um, that's, yeah, that's only because of negation types. And for the same reason, we have to add negation types uh to uh, as explicit information um uh -huh. and the crux of the problem is that um for for if you, if you want to have a, a nice intuitive degradational semantics and that goes nicely with the interpretation of types uh, a nice property is to have to interpret uh, types as ideals um, and in our case, we try to interpret types as ideals, and we quickly found that, well, the problem is that uh, uh, the set theoretic interpretation of a negation type is not an ideal for a uh, semantic subtype. Um, so, and a value is, I mean, a value in a language, what we wanted to have is this interpretation where types are ideals and values of the language are ideals and uh, you everything would go nicely together uh, but because of this problem with negation types we couldn't actually i this is an idea i had when uh, writing this part uh, so i have not uh, explored it uh, but by changing uh, the interpretation domain uh, by completely changing the interpreting domain, so from scratch, from uh, semantic subtyping, uh, uh, and getting rid of Agimo and, and these elements. Um, maybe we could get back this notion that types are ideals, but you have to, to introduce some form of, um, of new elements. I mean, 
you don't have to introduce new, new elements, but you have to, to introduce a notion, new notions to uh, your domain uh, to get back this property. Um, and in particular, the problem, well, to, to quickly uh, go in the details, um, what you have to do is add some uh, information about the limit of your interpretation so that you say, for example, that uh, a function maps well, you have to compare, uh, define a, an order relation on your denotations and maybe define something that uh, to, to represent your function in a finite way, uh, you have to define something that tells you maybe uh, this function maps every value greater than this one, every denotation greater than this one to this result. And basically you have to change the way you um, define uh, your function um, you interpret your functions to still have a finite representation of functions, but that incorporates enough information uh, to um, not get stuck on negation types and this framework mm -hmm. idea. So I agree that this is a bit unsatisfactory. Our approach is a bit unsatisfactory in the sense that we heavily modified the interpretation domain and we got a bit further from the interpretation of types as sets of values. But really, I, I think, I personally think that if we want to get back this correspondence, we have to find a completely, uh, in a completely different way of representing functions finitely um, so that uh, you can get back this notion that values are ideal. And Maybe this is worth uh, exploring. I, I have some ideas about this but that would require a lot of uh, work uh, starting from scratch. Uh, so the question is, um, should, I, should I store the rest of the questions for time reasons or, or ask one? Um, maybe one more question. Okay, I was thinking about the relationship between this approach to annotate functions with their types and an, an approach uh, that uh, uh, Philip Eisen has been using uh, where um, uh, functions uh, would, would be wrapped in uh, contracts. So basically you wouldn't have to type functions ex explicitly uh, with type annotations if you were willing, willing to carry around a heavier machinery for blame management. We'd be considering that approach. So I, I'm afraid I've not understood everything. Can so you can repeat what you have understood. Yeah, so, it, so that's an approach from Phrasen, right? So, so you compile, yeah. rather than adding type annotations to functions, you... Yeah. Invite them to contracts. Yeah, so basically you're considering functions as, as uh, um, boxes that cannot simply be in the institute for having any particular type. Uh, but if they are uh, used under a particular static type, then you, you put an upper that would throw, throw if it returns a wrong object. Yet. And the arguments uh, would be uh, wrapped uh, similarly such that you can keep track of uh, violating the promises that you have made in terms of uh, considering during this function type, and then you can run it and you can sort of go back, back to the place where it was cl claimed to have that particular type. Uh, but your functions are born with uh, a time notation that would uh, may, make possible to see whether, whether it's being treated as it as needed, immediate, uh, even though it's a higher order of value, uh, you're not going to run it with uh, arguments of wrong type and, and you're not going to encounter the situation that returns a value of a wrong type. Yeah, all right. So uh, I've not thought of this because, well, uh, a function with, with intersection types are still uh, future work, but yeah, I think this uh, this goes back to to what I've uh, answered uh, to Amal. Um, this may be a nice way of representing several compilations of the same function as a, a single uh, code. So, so you do not have to um, have multiple copies of the same code to 
introduced several casts. Uh, indeed, maybe you can use um, constructs or, or a form of um, information wrapper around uh, the argument of the function so that when you when you propagate uh, your argument inside the function and you encounter a cast, you know whether this cast applies to uh, your value or not. Maybe if the cast would also have some information to tell you that, well, uh, I only apply if uh, uh, you come from the Boolean part of the domain of the function, but not from the integer part of the domain of the function. And in this case, your value has this wrapper that tells you, well, I was applied supposing the domain was uh, int, so I, I should simply ignore this cast. And maybe we could find something this way, maybe represent uh, efficiently uh, such functions. Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's close to this approach, but from what I understood, I think that's something like this. Maybe you can use something like this. Yeah. So the approach with, with all, all the wrappers is not known for efficiency. So I <laughs> you should worry sure about that. That's probably yeah. better than uh, multiplying the code uh, as many times as we have uh, intersection types uh, in the annotations. Yeah. We need to hurry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Eric. And we'll move on to Jeremy C. from Indiana University. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Victor. Um, I'm just, it's really, really nice uh, PhD work, Victor. Um, I'm really pleased to see how far along you've pushed the denotational side of things, and that's just uh, really exciting. Um, so I've got about three questions, uh, one about the part one and then a couple about part two. Um, the first question is, um, has to do with the compilation to the CAS calculus and if I understand right, when, when we're using materialization to, to drive that, there's a there's a one challenge which has to do with coherency. And I'm wondering if you've thought more about that since um, you know, since we've talked last about that. Um, yeah, so you mean for the algorithmic part of compilation? Yeah, or maybe what what is what's sort of the current state in terms of what you're doing? Yeah, or maybe what are you doing algorithmically these days for yes. for translating to the CAS calculus? <clears throat> so we have not yet uh, yet changed uh, the approach uh, we published in the Popel paper and mm -hmm. we worked uh, on together. Uh, we are still on the same approach, generally, but we, I mean, we have some thoughts about how to improve it. Uh, mm -hmm. In particular, so you you know that what we did was um, when we have a, um, a precision constraint on types, we converted these types uh, to types with variables and used unification or, or um, tallying uh, the tallying algorithm for sexuality types uh, to to solve these constraints on variables. And indeed, there was this problem of of coherence, and you had a lot of post-processing to do on the types to preserve uh, the properties of the compilation. And for set sort of types, we could not even uh, preserve the completeness of the compilation because of this, uh, this post-processing operation. So um, we, we hope that with the second part of the series, um, rather than compiling precision constraints um, to constraints with type variables, we can directly use, uh, so I have it there, we can directly use this representation of materialization uh, to compile uh, precision constraints as subtyping constraints uh, on static types without adding new variables to the types. And I think this would mean that you could take every constraint you generate when compiling your uh, source language and convert them to constraints that act on static types and subtyping and nothing else. You do not have materialization constraints, so you do not have um, um, you do not have to perform unification uh, to solve uh, materialization. And I think we have not uh, studied this 
uh, into details yet, but I think this would solve a lot of problems. And for the same reasons as uh, this solves the, the, the problems we had with the uh, dynamic semantics of the class calculus, uh, by performing this operation, we get back to only uh, semantic operations on types, semantic comparisons on types, and you get rid of every syntactic um, operation that you perform on types. You don't have to, to preserve any syntactic, uh, you don't, well, you don't have to preserve any syntactic environment on, on your types when you compile your program. And I think this could greatly simplify uh, the compilation algorithm. So this is definitely something we have to, to, to pursue. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, now a couple of questions about part two. Um, I was looking at you know the different results that you have uh, for the denotational semantics, and uh, you've got a, a soundness result, uh, which is very nice. Uh, and then, so I guess the next question is, have you thought about adequacy? Which, and just what I mean by that is if the if the denotation of a of a program is equal to the denotation of like a lambda abstraction or some other you know, uh, immediately terminating value, um, then that should imply that the reduction semantics should take that same program to um, a, uh, a syntactic value, uh, like a lambda or something. Uh, so have you, have you looked into, into the adequacy or thought about that, the proof of that direction? So you mean for, for the gallery type lambda calculus? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because for the other calculus, uh, for the other calculi, we have uh, proven the adequacy. Well, for the um, not for CDUs, but for the previous languages, we have proven the adequacy. Um, well, for the gallery type language, yeah, I thought about this. The the, the problem comes from the um, the fact that our proof of adequacy, uh, like many, uses logical relations to relate between elements of uh, the interpretation domain and explorations. Um, and we, we had a, a big problem with uh, defining by relating uh, tags. So we have this dynamic and static tags on our elements and relating what it means, uh, well, defining what it means for an element with a dynamic tag to uh, be in relation with an expression, and the same for the element with a static tag. We could not really find a uh, nice intuition of this. And moreover, um, we could not find a logical relation. Uh, well, we could not find how to interpret uh, casts uh, in this logical relation. What is the role of casts? In this logical relation. So this, this, these are two questions uh, we need to solve before um, proving adequacy for the gallery types lambda calculus. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think this comes, this comes from from our understanding of cast and and uh, values. Uh, at the beginning, I was thinking of um, that maybe a value that is cast to question mark. You, when you cast a value to question mark, you take uh, the denotation of this value and add dynamic tags to it. And when you do the reverse operation, you take the denotation of the value and convert the dynamic tags into static tags. And I, I had this formalization of the denotation of the cast, which would have been really nice. Unfortunately, it didn't work exactly as I wanted. Uh, so um, this broke a bit my intuition about the logical relation uh, we need for adequacy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we need to find a new. That's interesting to hear about that. Sometimes, yeah, the sometimes the you learn a lot from the challenges that you run into, and it's good to know about those challenges. So good. Um, I guess my one last question is sort of a, a fairly technical one. I I was um, really interested to hear uh, to look at in your thesis how your your denotational semantics treats casts, in particular casts on functions or between function types. And so on, if you bear with me on page 226, I don't know if you have it handy, uh, but there's the uh, line four of the, or rule four of the definition there. Uh, yeah. is, is a, I was trying to decipher that and having trouble. And so, I'm, so I'm, maybe you could, uh, it'd be nice to have some sort of intuition about what, 
what that's intending to do. Uh, yeah, so to be, to be perfectly honest, um, at the beginning, I was hoping to, to find an intuitive way of defining the notational semantics and then deduce uh, uh, an operational semantics from this. Um, and I ended up being quite the opposite for this uh, rule. And in particular, I, I took the intuition, the intuition that I had from the operational semantics of a simply typed scalar type on diagrams and used them to, to define uh, the denotational semantics of, of, um, of it. And the idea is uh, basically what you would do with uh, the operational semantics of a uh, scalar type lambda calculus. Um, when you have a, a function, um, when you have, so a function is a relation that maps elements or sets of elements to a uh, result. Um, and when, when you cast it, the idea is to simply take the inputs of the function and um, cast them in reverse, following the, the reverse of the cast. So if you have a cast from t1 to t2, uh, going to t1, uh, t1 prime to t2 to, to, to prime, uh, what you do is you consider relations um, that you obtain by taking an input in tau one prime and, and casting them uh, back to tau one, which is something that which is uh, the standard way of reducing cast applications in, uh, and deferring the cast at the last moment. Mm -hmm. And for the result of the relation, well, you take your relations uh, in uh, the denotation of the cast uh, expression and you cast the result uh, from the output type of the left hand side to the output type of the right hand side. So mm -hmm. this covers basically, this is just a, a denotational uh, way of uh, splitting the, the cast on a function. Mm -hmm. um, so this covers the first line of the rule. And then the, the, the last two lines are simply uh, here to handle um, blamed and incorrect uh, cast. So what happens is, um, Either uh, when you cast the result of uh, the function, you obtain something that is not, um, uh, when you, well, no, when you cast the input of the function, you obtain something that gives you a blame, then uh, the function must return a blame. Um, and um, there is also the case where uh, if the function, the, the input of the function is not in the input type of the cast, so it, in this case it is not in the one prime, uh, then it is simply a type error, which is uh, denoted by omega. So the last, the, the last line is here to reconstruct uh, type error to propagate uh, the omega, which stands for type error. Um, and the second to last rule is here to handle blame where uh, when you cast, um, if you apply the cast on the input of your relation or on the output of your relation, you obtain a blame, then uh, the, the cast relation must produce a blame. Mm -hmm. Great. No, that was very helpful. Thank you, Victor. And, and that's it for my questions. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. So there, we still have uh, Giuseppe and myself to go, so I'll, I'll let uh, Giuseppe ask questions first. Well, I will not ask questions because I ask it a lot during these uh, six years. <laughs> or just want to say uh, how lucky I consider myself to have a student so good uh, like uh, Victor. And it's not just that uh, he's smart and uh, he's passionate, but it's also very, very, how to say, nice to work with him. Uh, and uh, I just hope that uh, he learned from me as much as uh, I learned from him. So, for you. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, I'll restrain myself to just one one question. Um, uh, as far as I under well, my the way I would like to use gradual typing in in real life would be perhaps to teach, especially to teach beginners. So I was wondering, it's kind of a double question, 
I was wondering if you have any experience in teaching with gradual typing. And I was also wondering um, when you look at some equivalences, so some claims that you made on, on slide 28, for instance, where you, you say something about int or question mark, yeah. or int and question mark. Uh, how would you explain this kind of claims at the bottom of the slide to someone who is a beginner? What is the intuition that yeah. you could give? That would be extremely difficult for the code. Yes. These two lines are actually, uh, actually when we found these results, they, they went against all our intuitions about the security guard days. Uh, when we found this, we, we, we actually, this actually changed uh, our perspective on our security types. I remember that in the very beginning of this work, we, we were thinking that uh, int and question mark were actually more or the same as int, and int or question mark was more or the same as question mark. Uh, so this is pretty counterintuitive. Um, so first, to, to answer your first question, I don't have any experience in teaching with gradual typing, but I've explained I've tried to explain pattern typing uh, in a very informal way, and, and I think I think it's a it can be a very nice way of introducing uh, the well types to uh, programming beginners. Um, you can really. I mean, they, they can. Uh, you can probably learn programming much, uh, much more quickly if you only have uh, a dynamically typed language, uh, and you don't have to care about types. Uh, you can quickly see uh, uh, whether a program works or not. You don't have to, to to wonder about types, and then you can maybe introduce types uh, well, gradually uh, using uh, other types. Uh, and for example, um, flow is really nice for this. Uh, the, um, well, it doesn't have gradual types, but um, you could imagine the same system where you can have a dynamic type language and you introduce types maybe using um, uh, comments in your code, and you would have the type checker check uh, these types. And yeah, that would be, I think, uh, from my experience in, in teaching, a nice way of introducing types uh, to. to to, uh, to beginners. Um, now, explaining these two lines, um, I mean, the, the best way, I think, is to simply uh, use an example. Um, if you have your type, well, I like to see, even though it's not always right, I, I like to see uh, a model type as a set of possibilities that you can obtain by replacing question marks with uh, types. Mm -hmm. um, and this means that if you have int and question mark, you can, for example, replace question mark with the type of natural numbers. And then you have int interested with uh, nats, the type of natural numbers, which, well, is equivalent to nats because it only contains uh, non-negative integers. Um, and this means that, in a sense, if you have a function like you have a square root function that only acts on natural numbers, um, you can uh, pass it something that is of type int and question mark. Because this can, you can say that if the question mark is not, then everything goes right. But you cannot pass it something that is int. So, in this sense, int and question mark is different too. From int and I would say, yeah, an example is the best way of explaining this fact. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's very possible otherwise. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's that's all for me. So um, does any member of the jury want to ask uh, one more question? No? Okay, thank you. So. I think we can uh, move to the, the, the private uh, Zoom channel. We, we can maybe break for a few minutes, five to ten minutes, and then meet again on the private Zoom channel.
Right. So I'll say this in French, maybe, or should I say it in English? No, in English. Yeah. In English, okay. In English. Yeah. Um, so, Victor, uh, the jury thought that you gave a very clear presentation of your work, and that you managed to compress the essence of it in a 50-minute talk, and to give a, a very good summary of your contribution, of the perspectives, and of the open problems, and uh, also, the jury wanted to emphasize that your results were often inspiring and thought-provoking. Um, they thought that given the broad range of the results, it was quite impressive that you were able to give such a, a clear, uh, concise presentation. Uh, in particular, the jury wanted to emphasize that you knew how to pick the right level of abstraction in your presentation, and even several levels of abstraction, going from the pizza and the pineapple <laughs> to much more technical details. Uh, and regarding your answers to the questions, uh, the jury was very happy with them. Uh, the, the questions were sometimes unexpected, sometimes very broad, sometimes very technical. And the, your answers to the questions uh, showed that you have a very good mastery of your domain and also that you knew exactly where are the limits uh, of what you know and what you don't know yet how to do. Uh, so for all these reasons, the, the jury uh, awards you the, the title of Doctor in Computer Science from uh, Université de Paris. And congratulations, congratulations, of course. For... Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, to all the members of the jury. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for, for the time you have given uh, to my work. Um, thank you for all your very interesting questions. And, and it felt wonderful to have all of you great people here for, for, my, for my defense. So thank you again. Um, I'll switch to French. Euh, merci, euh, merci à tous et toutes d'être venus. C'est incroyable d'avoir autant de gens. Euh, ça, fait, ça fait un plaisir dingue. Euh, merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Euh, vous avez tous et toutes joué un rôle à un moment dans ma vie, donc merci d'être là. Euh, merci d'être venu me soutenir. Et, euh, et merci beaucoup, Giuseppe. Merci pour ces six ans. Ça a été, ça a été six années assez incroyables. Euh, avec des détours par des licences de physique. Ça va, ça a été. Enfin, j'ai pas pu te répondre tout à l'heure, mais je pense avoir énormément avec toi et, et de ta patience et, et de ta capacité à toujours soutenir et toujours, euh, même dans les moments les plus difficiles, à toujours avoir les mots qu'il faut. Et donc, merci beaucoup. Et j'espère qu'à l'avenir, on aura toujours au moins le temps de discuter et au mieux le temps de travailler à deux. Toujours. <rire> Voilà, merci tout le monde, et puis euh, bah, vous êtes les bienvenus pour euh, un, un après-thèse au bar euh, un petit peu plus loin dans la rue d'à côté, c'est au Loma, ça s'appelle, qui est euh, Pan et, et Lozac. Just voilà. for the, the, our friends over there, he just said where we go to the bar for the day. <laughs> <laughs> not relevant information for you. <laughs> Congratulations, Victor. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Jury. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Bye. It's great to see you. Have a nice day. Si tu veux, la petite, 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 si tu veux, la petite